again, I, we have a very uh, great presentation from Joey that's coming up, but for those that don't know Joey, uh, Joey's a, currently a professor at the EECS at UC Berkeley. I know Joey well for, uh, because he's really created one of the most amazing courses on campus, uh, Data 100, that over 1,200 students, uh, uh, whether majoring in data science or just interested in data science, uh, study every semester. Uh, Joey has a great long track record of uh, innovation in the cloud and the computing space. Um, but so before, uh, you know, I, I don't think I could do justice to his amazing resume. So let me just hand it off to you, uh, Joey, and, and we'll have a please save your questions uh, until uh, the presentation is over. All right, okay. Joey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the cloud and beyond, a brief view of cloud computing research at UC Berkeley. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to try to make this talk pretty high level, um, talk about some of the lessons we've learned, uh, some of the impact we've had, uh, and sort of where we see the cloud going. Uh, and so uh, I, I know we, I guess, yeah, given it's recorded, we'll, we'll hold questions at the end, but maybe if you send me a message in chat, I can um, maybe try to, to keep an eye on them. Um, I'll bring up the chat here. All right, uh, so let's get started. Um, so give a, a bit more about me. So I'm now an associate professor. I, ju I just got tenure, actually, very exciting, last week um, in uh, ECS. I'm also one of the co-directors of the RISE Lab. Um, I also have some industry experience as well. I, before coming to Berkeley, I founded a company called Turi uh, to build data science tooling, sort of in the very beginning of the kind of the really uh, rise of the cloud. Um, and in some ways, we bet against where the cloud was heading. Uh, and, and that was a, a mistake. And I'll talk a bit more about you know, the implications of that and the startups that uh, have, have uh, come out of the lab since then uh, and how they've interacted with the cloud. I also just recently launched a company with some of my colleagues uh, to take some of our work in machine learning, uh, serverless computing, uh, and kind of bring them together to help people uh, integrate machine learning into their organizations. And this also has had a really big uh, kind of interaction with the, the success of the cloud and the, the modern data stack. Um, so I'm also part of the Berkeley AI Research Group. A large fraction of my research actually is on AI, uh, not directly the cloud, um, but we, we use the cloud in our AI work, and we're also now looking at how to use uh, the, our AI work to, to better uh, orchestrate parts of the cloud. Um, I'm also doing work on autonomous driving, and I was part of the Apache Spark project, which I'll, I'll talk a bit about, because that's sort of a kind of a neat connection between Berkeley and, and the evolution of the modern data stack and the cloud. Yeah, so I said research, uh, I do research in machine learning, distributed systems, work on autonomous driving, robotics, secure learning, uh, and a lot of this uh, in the cloud, both, uh, both to using the cloud and also supporting the cloud. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me just pull this up chat so I can see anything. Uh, very good, okay. So the outline for today's talk uh, is the following. So I want to look back uh, at the, the Berkeley Labs uh, and the cloud, and I'll talk a bit about how we got to where we are and, and how the, the lab structure at Berkeley in, in ECS for research and systems um, has made uh, ha has had a lot of impact. Um, so I'll talk about that. Um, I want to then talk about the RISE Lab, which is a lab that we are currently uh, running, the lab I'm a co-director of. It's also a lab that's about to end. Um, and so with the, uh, I'll talk about the research in the RISE Lab and, and sort of where it's pointing in this kind of serverless computing, um, the, the movement towards a more utility century or you know, utility uh, view of computing and what that might mean for the future of the cloud. Um, because this talk looks back on uh, a decade of work, so this is going to be work that's not just mine, but work but done by my colleagues. Um, many cases I will be collaborating, other cases will be work that, that others have done that I want to still highlight. Um, and I'm also pulling slides from over a decade of work, uh, and so formats, fonts, and stuff will be all over the place. I apologize up front. Um, we'll, just, we'll just overlook that. All right, so Berkeley has a pretty exciting lab, pro lab tradition of building these labs. Um, so you might have heard of some of these in the past, the PAR Lab, the AMP Lab, RAD Lab, Aspire Adept, and now RISE Lab, um, all looking at, uh, at big problems, but with a, a unique structure. And, and I want to highlight the structures. I think that's something that's pretty unique to Berkeley and how we approach problems in computing and how we have the impact that we have. So these research, research agendas, each of these labs span multiple areas of computing. So we try not to be just a, a systems lab, we are a systems lab that brings in machine learning. If we take on hardware, we think about hardware with security or other dimensions, uh, maybe hardware as it relates to clouds and data structure in, or data center um, infrastructure. So thinking uh, you know, more broadly about a specific problem area, bringing in multiple disciplines. Uh, there's also a, a, an emphasis on having a fixed duration. So we don't sit on a lab for 10, 20, 30 years, focusing on one agenda, we, we pick a goal. We pick a five-year horizon typically 
uh, and say, we want to accomplish something that we can in five years with a, a clear vision towards what that might be. Um, the other thing is that we look for emerging trends in computing. Uh, and so we try to, to follow where the research world's heading and how, uh, how that trajectory um, might influence the research we should be doing and, and maybe uh, how we can influence that trajectory. And again, I'll allude to how we've done that in the past. Uh, another thing that's been really uh, important to our, our, our uh, technique is to bring in significant industrial sponsorship and collaboration. So all these labs are not only supported by, but we collaborate closely with companies in, in the technology world in specific problem areas, uh, and, and in many cases with, uh, with cloud providers. So we've collaborated very closely with, with Amazon, for example, um, and, and that collaboration drove a lot of the success in, in these labs. And again, I'll highlight that in a moment. And then finally, one of the things that we've been really striving to do in, in, in our research is to not just focus on producing really good papers and superstar students and they go on to become faculty, we do that. We also focus on, on open source impact. So building not just the ideas, but the software that embodies those ideas. Um, and then not only making the software, but then going out and teaching people how to use it so it can have the full impact that it, you know, that it could have. Uh, so that's a big part of, of our, our formula. All right, so I've had the opportunity to be involved in two of these labs. Um, in the AMP lab, I was a postdoc. And then uh, after my postdoc, I came back to Berkeley as, as a faculty member in the RISE lab. Uh, and, and the RISE lab you know, is, is about to end. Uh, so this is a, a pretty long, uh, I guess, a 10-year period of, of research. Uh, and, and it has a pretty neat story and a really cool connection to the cloud. So that's what I'll try to highlight here. So going back to the AMP lab, so this is from 2011 to 2016, um, and the AMP Lab stands for Algorithms, Machines, and People, uh, bringing multiple disciplines together, people thinking about machine learning, uh, how to build systems at scale, um, and how to incorporate the crowd, how to incorporate people in this process to, to be able to make sense of data at scale, to make sense of big data. Um, as I said a moment ago, we focus on, on having a big part of open source impact as well. So in the AMP Lab, we built the the uh, Berkeley Data Analytics Stack, pronounced BADAS, um, B-D-A-S, uh, which was a platform of technologies to allow people to scale machine learning, computation, data analytics to very large amounts of data, uh, leveraging the, the emerging trends in the cloud. Uh, so big software impact. Um, it was actually quite a bit more than eight faculty involved in this lab. We, we sit in open space, so we have close collaboration with faculty in machine learning, statistics, uh, uh, broad systems, networking, um, even parts of compilers, uh, human, uh, human computer interaction, all in an open space, uh, closely collaborating. Um, we also have software engineering teams and, and software systems support to be able to build not just, again, you know, papers, but real software artifacts that endure. Uh, as I said earlier, we, we also focused on education. When we built these artifacts, we worked on, on camps, uh, which, which we ran annually to teach people how to use the software, again, to have the impact that we wanted to have. Um, funded by, by a large collaboration of people from industry and, and, and federal uh, funds. And, and this is important that with our industry sponsors, it wasn't just about taking money or, or cloud resources, it's about this closer collaboration to guide the research and to have the impact that we, we ultimately had. So I'm going to show you our Berkeley Data Analytics stack, uh, and the, it'll be neat to reflect on this. It's actually, these are slides from 2015, um, and so this is what it looked like then, and, and we'll talk about how it the kind of how it grew out to be what it is today. Um, so at the foundation of the stack was a storage tier, and it built on this kind of emerging trend at that point in time, which is the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, HDFS, we started developing new ways to, to reference data. Um, S3 was also a big part of this early uh, system, so it was kind of the early cloud um, back end as a service framework for storage. Uh, and this is what we were running on-premise, uh, and we'll see how these things evolved over time. Um, we have uh, Mesos as our middle tier, so this was kind of a resource management tier that we'd been developing. Um, Hadoop Yarn maybe was the close competitor at that point in time. Mesos uh, ultimately become a big company. It uh, was maybe a, a predecessor to Kubernetes and the sort of the container orchestration tools we see today. Um, and then the processing layer was, you know, where we, we had a lot of the research focusing on tools to process data at scale. Um, the Spark ecosystem grew out of a class project in this lab. Um, some of the, the tools for graph analytics, this my, my postdoc work is on the right side here, focused on, on machine learning and graph analytics and, and some early tools in, in prediction serving, kind of born out of this, this stack. And this is sort of the end of the, the, the AMP lab, the technology we had. Um, and just kind of highlight the impact that the, these, these projects had. These collection of technologies became part of what is today Apache Spark. Um, 
And so again, in 2015, uh, this was used by thousands of companies around the world. Uh, it had, was quickly becoming the de facto standard for big data processing. Today, I think it really is. Um, a few startups were launched out of that. Um, and we had some very successful uh, academic impacts. We had graduates that are now faculty at top universities uh, and two ACM doctoral dissertation awards. So a lot of software, a lot of impact, a lot of student impact, research impact, um, and industrial impact. I'm guessing many of you heard about Spark, but just one of the things that Spark did that was kind of neat is it brought together many different views of how we process data. So from SQL to machine learning to graphs, uh, all in a, in a common system. It allows to build sophisticated algorithms and have impact across different languages. Uh, we had a lot of growth. So <laughs> these are crazy numbers. So 57,000 people in, in the meetups for Spark. Uh, so it grew quite a bit out of a small class project. Okay. So again, 2015, looking at usage. Uh, so this is, these are actually small numbers, but we had clusters of 8,000 nodes. So that's pretty big scale for a, an academic project. Petabyte of data. Nowadays, I hear people processing this all the time with the Spark ecosystem. Um, very large streaming workloads being put into production. Um, and it won the, the 2014 on disk sorting record. So pretty successful um, technology. And then actually very recently, the, the company that was launched out of this, um, Databricks, uh, just reached a $38 billion valuation. is likely to probably be one of the biggest IPOs in history. Um, again, from a research project in a lab in collaboration with, uh, with the cloud. So I wanted to reflect back on why were we successful. And there are a lot of reasons we're successful, but I want to highlight one. Um, uh, and this is the Rad Lab. Uh, so the Rad Lab, uh, so this paper that was developed in the Rad Lab, so Rad Lab was 2006 to 2011, the predecessor to the AMP Lab. Um, and in the Rad Lab, there was a, a, a paper that was developed towards the end that, that framed uh, the cloud. Um, and this became one of the pretty influential papers um, in what is the cloud today. Uh, and it set out an exciting agenda of what the cloud could be. Um, so it was an 80, it's, you know, at, at this point in time, it's cited by, uh, I think that's off, it should be. 84,000, there's an extra zero there. Um, but yeah, it's a widely cited paper. Um, and it made the case uh, for cloud computing uh, by showing the kind of the illusion of infinite resources, um, the elimination of, of these kind of upfront costs, uh, the pay per use model of, of the cloud, uh, really the, the ability to exploit economies of scale, um, simplified the operations of managing large compute infrastructure by moving to the cloud, um, improving hardware utilization. So in, in some ways, these were you know, visions of what the cloud could be. Um, at that point in time, it wasn't quite true. And, and actually, we'll reflect on this again today. It's not entirely, not, not all these are fully met, but we're getting closer and closer with each evolution of, of the cloud technologies. Um, so this is a pretty influential paper. Uh, sorry, one second there. Um, uh, I should actually say one thing. I, uh, I've had colleagues tell me that this was a, a paper that, that's widely used by, by uh, industry groups uh, internally, that, that people share this paper as a, you know, kind of a must read for defining what the cloud is and, and what it, it, it ought to be. Um, all right, so pretty influential work. I think the cloud is, is a key element of the success of the AMP Lab, and, and I, I want to point to why. So the AMP Lab focused on scaling algorithms uh, and systems. Um, and if we had to do that in the resources that you know, the, the staff on this call helped us manage inside of our lab, we couldn't have scaled uh, beyond maybe 64 nodes, because that's what we could afford inside the lab um, for an, any extended period of time. And the campus data center probably can't support the kinds of experiments that we ended up doing. Um, so the cloud allowed us as students and postdocs and, and, and faculty to do very large scale systems experiments. So as a postdoc in the app lab, I would frequently run experiments um, multiple experiments at the same time with hundreds of machines each. Um, and so we could really study how scale changes computation, how it, stand, how it changes algorithms, and we could do that economically. Now, we had to shut the machines down right after the experiment, but we could actually do these very large experiments to understand how scale affects everything from, from our algorithms to the systems we were building. And the other side of this, I think, is interesting is the industrial adoption. Uh, I think that was enabled by the cloud. Um, companies were able to evaluate our open source academic big data tools without big upfront investments. And they could realize that our you know, really cool research projects actually could have impact in those companies. Um, and so they could try and, and, and sort of taste the potential gains you could get from using scale, using algorithms and, and the systems we were building on the, the, the data that they, all the data that they had um, using the cloud without, again, having to have this, this big upfront investment to try the, these new ideas and these new tools. 
So I think the cloud was what made the AmpLab possible. Uh, as the AmpLab ended, there were a few things we didn't address. And so this will sort of motivate where we are today with the RISE Lab and, and kind of where we're headed. All right, so we built tools to analyze data and train models, but we didn't think much about what to do once we've finished training those models uh, or finished that data analysis. And this is totally reasonable because in the, the machine learning world, you don't really write about that. You write about how you trained the model and how it was way more accurate than the model before it. Um, and there's sort of less thought on, well, so what? So what do you do with the model? Um, and, and the systems around that. And so that's something we had to you know, reflect on as we were ending the app lab and, and as we were launching the RISE lab. We focused a lot on, on the classic machine learning world, uh, this kind of regression, data processing. And, and I say classic, it's funny, because I have a company now and I talk to lots of customers and the majority of them are still in this classic world. Uh, but there are a few that are moving towards deep learning in academia and, and maybe the future of machine learning is towards these more computationally intensive techniques where it's not just about the data that's, that's challenging, it's about managing computation, new kinds of computations, things like reinforcement learning that change how we interact with with data or what data is, it becomes a simulation, something we have to run as a computation instead of just you know, look up and, and store uh, in, in a, a file system. And then as these new technologies evolved, so did the, the question around what does it mean to, to make sense of the predictions? Uh, can we understand our models or can we understand the data that, that went into those models? And so we started to kind of, what, what is the role of, of the systems and the algorithms, the models in, in understanding our predictions? And then there was security. Uh, and, and I'm not joking, security, we really did not consider much security in the uh, AMP lab. Um, the systems we built, we assumed were isolated, perhaps nicely in, in a, a, a virtual private uh, network. Um, we, we didn't think about uh, what security could do uh, as an enabling technology. Um, and so we went to like, how do we make our systems more secure, but maybe how do we use security to, to allow us to do more with, uh, with, with our systems? All right, so with those in mind, uh, we launched the RISE Lab. Um, and so this is the ongoing lab that builds on where we sort of left off in the AMP Lab. Uh, and the RISE Lab is a, another acronym, uh, and it stands for Real-Time Intelligent, Secure, uh, and Explainable Algorithm System. So that is what we study. Um, what does that mean? So it has applications in things from fraud analysis, we have to make decisions quickly as you swipe your credit card, uh, robotic surgery, something we actually work on, uh, high frequency trading, reasoning about financial markets, uh, autonomous driving, again, another thing we work on, uh, where you need to be able to use intelligent algorithms, make decisions reliably and hopefully do so securely. Uh, and then even thinking about the, the kind of the edge, the, the devices that have become a key part of our lives. Uh, all of them have some degree of intelligence, all of them connect to the cloud, um, and they all need to be able to do so and uh, do so securely uh, and provide insight and value through the use of, of you know, learning techniques. So that is the world that we're, we're trying to address. Um, and when we say real time, we, we mean being able to respond in milliseconds, so much, uh, much greater focus on latency. It's not about processing you know, petabytes of data, it's about being able to process a small amount of data very quickly. Um, using sophisticated models and algorithms, this is a transition towards more deep learning, more advanced uh, AI techniques. Um, when we say secure, we need to protect the data, the system, and, and ideally even unlock new data through, through better security mechanisms. Um, and then when we say explainable, we need our decisions to be audible, verifiable, um, and, and this will, will connect to ideas and data lineage, but also to you know, work in explainable AI and, and how we can make sense of what a model is trying to tell us. All right, so uh, as with prior labs, we kept this idea of really bringing in people from very different disciplines. So we collaborated more closely with the Berkeley AI Research Group. Uh, we brought in faculty from AI. Uh, we have faculty from security, a stronger emphasis on security this time. Uh, we continue to think about hardware, its connection to security and AI. Um, and we, we continue to focus on the, the big systems agenda that, that we had started uh, with, with the kind of the end of the AMP lab. All right, so there's a lot of research going on in the RISE Lab. Uh, what I want to do is just highlight a few of the projects. As I said, I'm going to try to keep this talk generally high level, so I'm actually not going to present detailed results. I'm going to sort of present the kinds of questions that we're, we're studying uh, and sort of the technologies, ideas that we're exploring to answer those questions. Um, so the first uh, is distributed computing. So in, in, in the AMP Lab, we thought a lot about how to process data at scale. Uh, in the RISE Lab, we're thinking a lot more about how to process computation, manage computation at scale. Um, we've built systems like Ray, uh, which is a sort of a general purpose distributed Python uh, framework, giving actors, tasks, different models for distributed computing in, in the Python ecosystem. Um, we chose a Python ecosystem because that is where a lot of the, the state-of-the-art machine learning is today. 
Uh, we built tools for reinforcement learning that run in, in this distributed environment, uh, tools for automatically managing uh, experiments, which I'll talk more about in a moment, um, for, again, running uh, experiments in the, these uh, distributed compute environments. And all of these are, again, built primarily with the focus on, on the cloud. Uh, in fact, all of them came with, uh, the, the software artifacts uh, came with tools to leverage auto-scaling um, in, in various cloud providers. I think the initial uh, cuts were, were largely for AWS, uh, but they've since grown out to support other clouds as well. Um, so really focused on uh, scale, not just data, but computation, um, and interesting uh, emerging kinds of computation. Uh, the other thing that happened is, you know, with deep learning, is there a stronger emphasis on the, the individual accelerators, the GPU and the TPU? And so in the, the new lab, we've been thinking about not just how do we scale out, but how do we scale uh, an, indi an individual computation to make it more efficient? Um, so a lot of work there. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, the end of machine learning for the machine learning paper is, you know, is writing the paper, training the model, that's it. Uh, in the real world, that's actually just the beginning. The, the real exciting story is when you've built the model, how you connect it to everything. Um, and, and that's what we've been doing for our work in prediction serving. We built some of the early, in fact, some of the early, the, the first systems for general purpose prediction serving, uh, thinking about how to, to make those more composable, um, how to integrate them with, uh, with serverless computing technologies, um, and then more recently, how to manage the data that goes into those prediction uh, systems. We said real time, uh, so starting to think in the cyber physical realm, uh, we've actually built an autonomous vehicle platform, which drives real students, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and we've also been thinking about how we can use serverless computing to augment the capabilities of robotic platforms. Uh, sort of, if you imagine a robot, in, in this case, actually a robot that's responsible for cleaning rooms. So if it's, you know, decluttering an environment uh, and it encounters an especially a messy room like mine, um, that you might actually need additional compute. Uh, and so using the elasticity of the cloud to support robotics applications has been uh, something we've been uh, really pushing on in the new lab. All right, so I said autonomous driving. Um, so we've built, uh, in fact, taking ideas and data flow computing from the AMP lab uh, and saying, can we use those same concepts to manage the data center that's essentially in the back of the car? Uh, so collections of, of distributed nodes with accelerators attached to them, taking many different data feeds and trying to process them in real time. Um, and so we've been doing that uh, and using those same data flow technologies. It's the cloud, and that's something we're actually looking at now, is how do these kinds of systems integrate and, and share information across uh, other vehicles, for example, um, to, to have you know, updated HD maps in response to the, the data that they encounter as they drive. Okay, uh, autonomous driving, oh, one other highlight from this. Um, whoops. Uh, so we've also, uh, on the test track, just, just as a fun aside, um, we have to actually test, one of the things we've been studying is, is how a vehicle responds, uh, um, how it adjusts its deadlines in response to, let's say, an obstacle. So if, if James Bond was standing in front of the car, how do we know um, how to schedule jobs to make sure that we run the appropriate computer vision pipelines in time to stop the vehicle before hitting James Bond? Um, and so we actually have a cardboard James Bond so that the computer vision algorithms can see him, um, but also so the car can run him over if the algorithm fails. Um, and so that's how I've been testing uh, collisions uh, with, with, with uh, pedestrian avoidance algorithms. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see. So I, I mentioned explainability. Uh, this is something that we've, we've been working on. I don't know that we have great answers for yet, but uh, one of the, the big challenges in modern AI is that the algorithms that we've been developing, these uh, neural nets, um, don't provide a lot of visibility into how they came to a decision. They go, well, that is a dog. Uh, and and you, why? I don't know. Um, it's actually not clear what that is, but uh, you, you'd you like the algorithm to go, you know, that looks like a dog, but it, it also could be a bird. I guess in this case, you know, it's a bird, but it could be a dog. Um, and so giving some indication of the paths and the confidence in those paths um, is something that we've been kind of digging into, sort of building uh, on classic ideas and decision trees, which have some degree of interpretability, um, and then connecting them to, to recent work in, in neural networks and deep learning. Um, so this is uh, kind of the AI side of it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't include slides. We've also been looking at um, how to diagnose problems uh, by connecting back to the data and tools for sort of uh, training models that, that keep uh, information about the training process so that when things go wrong, uh, you can, can understand not, not just what happened at the computation level, but the data that, that led to those decisions. All right, uh, explainability and then security. Uh, so security became a big focus of the lab um, and not in the way you might think. So yes, we want to make things secure. I should say we actually did get hacked a couple of times. Some of the systems we built still aren't that secure, um, but that wasn't the security that we were excited about. Um, the security we were excited about is how we can use security to enable new things. Um, and to give you an example of that, one of the, the projects that, that I'm pretty excited about was 
uh, enabling competing entities to work together to solve a problem. Um, and so you can imagine a bunch of banks, for example, and they want to identify fraudulent users. Um, and the best way to do that would be to share all of their customer purchase information, all the data they have about all of their customers. Of course, each bank could use that uh, as leverage against the others to make better decisions about how to invest. And so banks don't generally want to share all of their customer information. Um, but we can use com uh, machine learning techniques combined with cryptographic ideas to enable them to work together to build the model as though they were sharing the data, uh, but ensure that, that none of them actually can see the underlying data that was used to build that model. Um, and in fact, we can keep that model encrypted and, and use it to just evaluate fraud on individuals without having to actually go and, and remove, uh, you know, expose the model. So thinking about how to make, uh, uh, how to leverage security to open up new possibilities of collaboration. Um, going back to the Spark ecosystem, uh, again, we could add passwords to Spark or access controls. That's not the exciting part. What would be exciting is being able to um, run Spark without ever decrypting your data. And so looking at how to use advances in hardware enclaves, so advances in underlying uh, processor architecture to support advanced analytics on data without ever having to decrypt it, which means that the data remains encrypted all the way into the CPU. Uh, and what that enables is uh, computation in untrusted clouds. So I can run analytics on, on, uh, on an AWS machine and be confident that no one at Amazon, no matter how hard they try, um, can make sense of what I'm doing. Uh, only I have visibility in, in the output of that computation. Um, and so this is pretty neat work. Uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities. It makes things much safer. You know, maybe I do trust Amazon, but I don't trust you know, the, the, my employees that are perhaps putting some of the data on those machines, or I don't trust the software packages um, on, on those, uh, those machines. So this gives me a way to, to kind of minimize the scope of trust that I need uh, to just the very piece of analytics that I'm running. Uh, and we've been also extending this to work not just within a, a single cloud or a single data center, um, but to be able to do this across the WAN. So if I want to run uh, these kinds of analytics in a more federated fashion, um, we've, we've developed ways to do that. So in the process, we've built a lot of software. Um, and as I said earlier, it's sort of a hallmark of how we approach problem solving in these big labs. Uh, and so we, we build these stacks. It's not entirely clear that every box belongs on every other box. Sometimes I joke there's a third dimension. If you just put this in the third dimension, all the boxes just fall on the floor. But um, there, there is some structure to it. So at the top level, we've been exploring a range of applications from autonomous driving to how to you know, make sense of pandas, uh, smarter query processing, uh, robotic decluttering. And these build on technologies like, let's say, uh, the, the Ray ecosystem, which is managing um, uh, tools for, for uh, rendering predictions, prediction serving, tuning models, reinforcement learning, and so on. Um, so we, we try to the extent possible leverage each of the, you know, the things we build to build the next thing. Um, so there's projects like MC2, uh, which is our, a lot of the security work, um, doesn't yet run in the Ray ecosystem, but that's something you know, we're, we're, we're working on. Um, but that built on top of projects like Spark and integrates with a lot of the open source community. Um, yeah, so to give a picture, a lot of different projects coming to the lab. Uh, what I want to do here uh, is highlight, as I did with the, the AMP Lab, some of the bigger projects that have gotten some, some bigger adoption. Um, and so Ray is probably the, the biggest of this, this group. Um, this is a plot, I don't know how excited about this plot, but it, it does illustrate a pretty neat story. Um, and so this is the, the uh, star, I think star count for various projects on GitHub. Um, and, and here is the Apache Spark project. Uh, and here is the new Ray project uh, from, from the, the RISE lab. Um, it's not Apache Spark, that's a, it's a big project, but it has the same kind of slope. Um, so we're building technologies that, that are getting a lot of at least open source interest. Uh, and, and that's, again, part of the story of focusing not just on, on academic, like academic published impact, um, but, but also software impact as well. Um, so Ray's pretty neat. Uh, it's actually getting some, um, you know, starting to get some commercial adoption um, by bigger companies to replace parts of their, their machine learning or, or kind of data science ecosystem, um, supporting distributed model training, uh, companies like Uber. So starting to see some adoption. Some fun stories as well. So the reinforcement learning work that we developed on top of Ray um, to support this kind of new paradigm of learning, or actually classic paradigm of learning, but you know, been recently reinvigorated um, with the, with the ability to t take feedback, adjust, uh, adjust um, our model or predictions based on that feedback and iterate in, in a kind of more closed loop fashion. Uh, and so they using uh, RLib, uh, America's Cup, uh, they designed a better boat and they also built a better, sa a better AI based sailor um, to get significantly better results and I guess ultimately win the America's Cup using some of these technologies. So uh, starting to see some, some interesting kinds of impact in the software. And I, as, as has become a trend, I guess, with the labs, 
um, as they kind of wind down. Um, the students that, that don't want to go off and become you know, superstar professors um, often decide to go to industry and take the technologies they've been developing and try to commercialize them and build the ecosystem around them. Um, and so any scale has been launched to, to commercialize uh, the Ray platform. It's already at Series B funding and it's doing quite well. So, uh, you know, this is building jobs, I guess, for a lot of people and also for the, the students that are graduating, uh, a chance for them to, to take their ideas uh, and, and, and uh, maximize impact. Um, and the same is actually happening for security. It's kind of cool. So some of the, the projects like Opaque that allowed us to do these secure analytics over data um, are starting to get funding and, and actually starting to take off. And so students are launching, um, or students launched a project around that as well, or a company. Um, I should say, I also have a box on this, this diagram, but we're still in stealth mode, so I can't uh, share that box with you uh, today. Uh, but you know, broadly speaking, thinking about how serverless computing and, and machine learning work together to you know, enable companies to use machine learning to, to solve new kinds of problems. All right, that's the picture of the Rise Lab. I wanted to stop and think a bit about the cloud. And in the process, I want to jump into just one of the projects in a little bit more detail uh, to tell you kind of how the cloud influenced the Rise Lab in interesting ways. So of course, it allows us to continue to scale research. Uh, and that's you know, something we've really exploited in, in these labs. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry. Question there. Um, I'll come back to questions at the end, but yeah, so it allows to exploit scale. Um, it allowed us to access the latest hardware, GPUs, TPUs, uh, and this was pretty critical to a lot of the core AI research. Um, we didn't have a lot of GPU machines. We still don't have a lot of GPU machines. We have more since we started. Um, but yeah, being able to do this research to compete with, with big companies requires us to be at least temporarily burst to large amounts of compute resources. Um, so here's a picture of our compute usage. Uh, I removed the y-axis because it's embarrassing. Um, but yeah, we use a lot of compute. Uh, I've clustered it by year, and so you can see the kind of the, the yearly pattern. Um, there's a few things I want to highlight here. So one is there's this, this exciting cluster of, uh, of usage that's around conference deadlines. Uh, this is right here, I think, is a major systems deadline, and like right here is a major machine learning deadline. So they kind of pile up, and there's this like spike of usage. Uh, and this is when you know we just don't have enough compute in a lab to support all the students that want to, to run their experiments. And they're like, look, you know, this is my thesis work. I need to get this experiment out, and I have just two weeks to finish my results. Uh, I need I need more machines. Uh, and so being able to jump to the cloud, then they go on summer summer holiday and they take a break, and then you know they come back and like ready to get some research done, and then you know winter holiday and, and the process repeats. So you can kind of see this really cool pattern. Um, and the other important part of this is that there is no way we could afford this giant rectangle. Uh, we have a chance at being able to afford the blue region of the rectangle, uh, especially since these, you know, th this is coarse and these are like spikes and then they drop spikes and they drop. Um, and so it's that structure that, that the cloud enables, that, that usage of computing, that allows us to, again, do this crazy scale research um, and be able to afford it. Uh, so pretty, pretty neat uh, kind of realization of the, of the cloud. So kind of driving home the story of elasticity, one of the things we actually started to do is like, there's research here in, in how we can leverage elasticity to do the AI research more effectively. Um, and I want to show you a fun story about that. So uh, if you look at any machine learning paper, you probably find a plot that's sort of like this, and maybe iterations on, on the x-axis. Um, and, and, and there'll be a curve that goes, look, here's our model. And you know, this is the accuracy after time, iterations. Uh, and, and like this point right here, this is the accuracy we published. This is the most accurate model that's ever come, you know, ever been published. And there's the other guys that are over here and they're just, they're just not as good as, as my model. Um, and this is usually the deadline because, you know, they would have run it further and gone a little bit higher and then bragged a bit more, but, you know, they have to publish the paper and it's due at this point. So that's when they stop running the experiment. Um, so that, that's what we, we see in the paper. But there's a bigger backstory to this. And this is what the real research looks like. Uh, you know, three weeks, four weeks before the deadline. Um, there's a bunch of ideas that the, the students are trying, you know, like, hey, maybe I'll try it this way, I'll change the parameters, you know, change the loss function. Uh, so a bunch of ideas. Gets close to the deadline, start to panic, take some of the best ones, do some more tweaking. And then it's like, it's, it's a week out. And you're like, all right, now I've got like six things I need to try, 10 things I need to try. I'm going to, you know, I'm pretty sure these are the best ones. I'm going to try all of them and I'll publish this orange one, which will be like the, you know, the, the big result that we got to. Um, and so, so this is the picture. Uh, we hope that we never see, but in reality, it's probably true that there were configurations, better ways to do the research uh, that weren't tried um, because you, we just didn't have enough GPUs at this point or didn't have enough machines to run the experiments we wanted to run. Um, so what we started thinking is like, what if we zoom in on this piece here? Can we be more intelligent about how we use our time and, and, and how we use our, our machines or, or realistically our, our budget? Um, and there's kind of two patterns that emerge, two extremes. One is that I have thousands of things I could try. 
why don't I try each one on a separate piece of hardware? Uh, completely independently, it'll take a while to get any signal if any of these are good, uh, but I can try a lot concurrently. And this is like perfect scaling. Um, so, you know, more GPUs, I can try more things. And so this is the kind of mantra that, that in the cloud, uh, fast is cheap. This is true. So I, it doesn't, getting the answer sooner is the same expense as, as waiting, you know, all week to try all the configurations serially or all month. Um, so this is a good place to be. But in order to really get maximum accuracy, I need to put enough GPUs on any one trial to really push that specific configuration as far as it can go. And this is the exploitation side of this picture. Um, the problem with the exploitation side is it doesn't scale that well. Um, so a lot of the, the networks and things we're studying, you know, they'll scale a little bit, but after a certain amount of hardware, they actually stop scaling. And so you're left wondering, well, you know, like how far can I get uh, with, you know, if I have eight GPUs and I have, you know, four experiments to try, can I really use those GPUs efficiently or cost effectively? So we started thinking about a different view on, on how we manage our experiments. So we live in a world or lived in a world where we would have, you know, we owned four machines, eight machines. So we have that amount of, of resources. And, you know, it's now when the deadline is two weeks away, we have this rectangle that we can work with. Um, but as we move to the cloud, it's a different story. Uh, it's money is our resource. And so we can have as many machines as we want right now, but that means that we'll have fewer machines later. And so we get to change the shape of this box. And if we can choose the right shape of the box, we can maybe get better results um, by playing off how much we exploit in the, uh, explore in the beginning and exploit in the end. So we started developing an algorithm that actually does this. Uh, and so, you know, this is the, the standard deadline picture where I've been trying a couple of different things. I, you know, tried a few last minute, hey, maybe these will work. And then I, whatever was the best one, you know, it got close to the deadline, like give up on everything else, put all your resources on this, this model and hope for the best. Um, that's one world view, uh, but if we can use the cloud, then maybe we can buy an extra GPU. Uh, we can buy even more GPUs, take the, the resources we would have used on this experiment, put them on an additional GPU, and maybe we got lucky because we could do more exploration in the beginning. We found this actual better configuration early on, and then what would have happened is that, well, because we found that, we would have then given that one more time to train, and maybe at the end, actually giving it all the GPUs that we could afford at the end of the experiment. So, because we've bought these GPUs, we only have three GPUs left as we get close to the deadline. Um, and so this triangular pattern is a better way to do research in machine learning, uh, and it's leveraging this elasticity. Um, and so that is what we found, and, and we actually, and I, again, I won't talk about the theory, we've developed some theory behind this and some algorithms based on banded techniques that, that optimally uh, resolve these triangles um, with the uncertainty we have about these different experimental configurations. All right, so it's getting outside of this box. So I drew a two-dimensional box, but there's really storage, compute, and time that I need to manage. And in the cloud, I can change the shape of this box throughout time. And by changing the shape, I can get better results. Um, and so thinking of this cloud as elastic in, in these dimensions of storage allows us to do a lot more in the research uh, that we're doing. All right, so I have just a few minutes left, so I want to wrap up with uh, some thoughts on where the world's heading. Um, so we've been thinking of the cloud uh, as it progresses in the future more as a utility. And this is sort of the serverless uh, view on computing. Um, there are two pretty influential papers already out of the, the RISE lab looking at both a negative take and, and a more positive take on what serverless means. Um, both ultimately uh, project a future which is, is, is fully serverless, but, um, but how we get there will be, you know, that's something we're still, still working on. Um, so just to give you an idea of what, what I mean by serverless. Uh, you know, if you think of a standard application today, maybe I'm, I'm taking an image and I need to resize it. Uh, in in the, the cloud as it existed, maybe at the end of the AMP lab, there was a focus on, you know, you run some VMs. They're in the clouds. You're not actually managing the hardware, uh, but you're, you're, you're managing the VMs and you're making sure they're up and stuff. Uh, and all you really need to do is run some Python code to take this image and make it smaller. Um, but you have this whole infrastructure you're managing to support that task. The serverless idea, and at least in its simplest incarnation, is that, you know, really I should just be giving the cloud some Python code and say, cloud, figure out the right resources, how to manage it, uh, how to run that code for me, uh, so that it, it does what I need it to do. Uh, and this was this kind of movement to functions as a service. So I'm giving the, the cloud my piece of code, uh, and it's going to run that function as a service for me, and I don't have to think about the VMs or the, the hardware that, that runs those functions. Um, Actually, in this story is this backend service. Where it was sort of predated. It showed up in the AMP lab, this S3, different storage mechanisms where you already stop thinking about, well, do I need to allocate a hard disk? No. You just say, I want some storage. Here are some bytes. Put them somewhere so I can get them later. Um, and that's already getting, a, you know, getting to this new model of computing where you're not thinking about the, the resource directly, but about the thing you want to do with the resource. Um, so AWS Lambda is probably the first 
uh, you know, function as a service platform that really got broad adoption. Um, and it, you know, it introduced big ideas like uh, very elastic auto scaling, scaling down to zero. So when you're not using something, you're not paying for it. Very fine grained billing. Um, some of the risk and challenges of, of the of the running your functions are, are pushed to the cloud. So so it's their job to also figure out how to make sure they're getting good utilization. Um, better isolation for multiplexing, and of course benefit from a lot of the, the you know services Amazon already provided. So this was one of the first attempts at this you know function of service. It's still probably one of the, the more uh, widely regarded, but now most cloud providers have some variation of this kind of function of service model. Um, and so if we look at the clouds that's evolving, this was a serverful cloud, uh, serverful in that you had to think about virtual machines and, and physical networks and allocating elastic storage uh, volumes. And, and the serverless cloud is more thinking about, I have computation and, and services that run that computation that manage my state and so on. Um, and applications being built on this new, new tier are, are gonna be even more elastic, more efficient um, and, and where the cloud is headed. Um, so to give a, a simple definition of kind of the essential qualities of a serverless uh, uh, serverless computing is that it well serverless means it's hiding the servers um, and the complexity of programming operating them. Um, it offers a, a model of, of uh, economic model that's more pay per use as opposed to uh, pay for the opportunity, pay pay for the resource. You're paying for the actual consumption of that resource. Um, so it's more consumption than uh, capacity uh, capacity based billing. Um, and then a key part of what makes this work is that the cloud has to be responsible for scale, for managing how things change over time. So it has excellent auto scaling is, is a key characteristic of, of real serverless platforms that um, I just don't need to think about how resources are provisioned. They're provisioned as needed um, in response to any variability in my workload. Uh, we, we developed an analogy, which I find a little bit helpful. So maybe I'll walk this quickly uh, for those who are like, I don't really get the serverless story. Um, the analogy goes sort of like this. If you're flying to a conference and you arrive at the destination airport and you need to get to your hotel, um, there are a couple ways you could do it. One way is you could buy a car, which sounds crazy, but maybe if you're gonna like, you're gonna live at this conference for the next like six years, maybe that, that's a good idea. But uh, if you buy a car, you're taking on a long-term investment, you're responsible for basically everything. Um, and this is sort of the sort of like the on-premise approach to, to computing. And there are reasons you might do this, uh, but in this analogy, it makes a lot less sense because this is something that's you know, ephemeral. I might, you know, I'm not gonna need to be at that conference hopefully for you know, six, seven years. Um, so I might also consider renting a car. And again, sort of depends on how long I'm going. Um, the renting car is nice because now I'm, I'm responsible for fuel, parking, insurance. Um, I'll get the latest car every time I rent it. So you know, everything gets up to date. Um, there are things I don't have to deal with kind of the lifetime of that car, uh, but there's still stuff I have to deal with. And then the serverless model is more like taking an Uber. Um, you're paying a premium, um, but you're paying for just what you need, which is that transportation from A to B. Um, and, and Uber is responsible for making sure the car is good, ready, up to date, and so on. Uh, Uber and, and the, the, the driver. So it's taking that responsibility out of the, the user's hands and pushing it up, in this case, to the cloud. Um, and that, that is where serverless is heading. And if you think about where cars are heading, they're also sort of heading in this direction too. Um, so we think of serverless as sort of the next phase of computing um, for the reasons that, that I've already alluded to. So uh, APIs, uh, the idea that, actually I'll just jump to the, the second part here. So the idea that we're writing applications and not infrastructure, um, and be able to run them at scale. Um, this movement to more fine-grained billing uh, and think about consumed resources and services. Um, and then the cloud provider assumes a lot of responsibility for all aspects of the system. And, and to get to this world takes uh, solving a number of open research challenges. Um, maybe the big ones are the cloud has to be a lot smarter about how it learns about workloads, being able to, to forecast future behaviors. Um, we need more fine-grained uh, multi-tenancy isolation, needs support for specialized hardware. And these are actually projects that we're working on in the lab to address many of these. Um, so in the last minute, I wanna just put up one thought. Um, and where is the cloud headed next? And so if we think about what's happened at, at each of these labs and over time, um, we've raised the abstraction. Uh, and so this continual movement from hardware to virtualized machines to virtualized services, um, it creates a, a boundary on which the application can innovate and the cloud can concurrently innovate. And it also simplifies this interface layer. Um, and I think that opens up the possibility for a, a world where there are many different clouds that can compete easily across uh, different applications. Um, and that the, the, these, these parts down here become, uh, the clouds themselves become in a sense more compatible. And this is something we're looking into the future of the RISE lab, the next lab is thinking about 
you know, what would it look like in a world where I could jump between different cloud providers um, very easily using any number of different uh, platforms or abstractions? Um, not a standard, but sort of the, the evolution of the cloud towards very simple APIs that, that can be easily programmed. Um, and, and can I start to leverage strengths of individual clouds to do things like uh, machine learning, where I might use Azure, which has certain security capabilities, Google, which has certain accelerators for training, and maybe AWS, which has certain accelerators for inference. So starting to be able to mix some of the advantages of the cloud, allowing the clouds to then innovate very aggressively in, in what they, the services they provide underneath this abstraction layer. All right, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I have some conjectures for the future. Maybe I'll leave this up and, and take some questions. Thanks, Joey. Um, we do have a few questions on the chat. Um, Bill, do you want to help moderate that piece? I'll stop sure. Uh, so let's see, we'll take it from the beginning. Uh, so Tam has a question. Hello, can you clarify on the difference between classic machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning, and why you chose classic? Um, yeah, so the, the, I sort of alluded to this, I, I guess, in the, in the discussion, but um, I, classic is funny. Classic is, is we're thinking more uh, statistical methods, linear models, uh, decision trees. Um, I, again, we're still doing research in them, so classic is you know a little de uh, demeaning, um, and they're still widely used. Uh, maybe I, the appropriate term is the kind of the movement towards deep learning as as a, a new trend in, in in machine learning, which is really complex functions uh, that are wildly non-convex and non-interpretable, um, and and you know how we use those to solve new problems. Okay, thank you. Eric has a question. What's the best way or method to protect protect your intellectual property that's on the cloud from people trying to steal or copy it? And should we be careful of thieves uh, when keeping intellectual property on the cloud? So you kind of alluded to some aspects of that question. Yeah, there are different security mechanisms. Um, I, <clears throat> so uh, maybe short answer is uh, encrypting your data is a good place to start. Um, and if you encrypt your data uh, in a way that even the cloud can't access it, um, that's a great place to be. Problem is you can't work with it unless you use some of the research we've been doing uh, to without decrypting it. Uh, and so um, that's, that's a very, uh, conservative answer. Um, I think the cloud is safer than most places to store your data if you're using it correctly. Um, and and yeah, mm -hmm. so if you're using the cloud correctly, maybe you shouldn't be as worried. Uh, I've certainly talked to a lot of companies that are storing very sensitive information in the cloud and, and doing so effectively using a lot of the pretty rich security ecosystem that's been created. And then we'll do one more question. And this one is from uh, Kang Win. Did I say that right? Uh, so if future, if cloudless is the future in the cloud, um, what do you think will need to happen before cloudless becomes mainstream? It's and maybe question. I'm going to add on to that and ask you to speculate about the next iteration of the lab that's yep. coming in the future. And does that tie in with his question? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're thinking, we, it's funny, uh, some of my students have actually said, use the word cloudless. Uh, we're calling it Sky. Sky Lab has, a, has its problems um, as a name, but uh, Sky being the thing above the clouds. Uh, we are, that will likely be the future of the RISE Lab. Uh, the next lab will, will look at this question of um, how, do we, how do we find a world in which you can, the cloud itself becomes really a resource uh, that is a, has a common abstraction. So you can take the best of each of the cloud offerings um, and build applications on top of that. Um, and so part of it is developing better abstractions uh, that lay, you know, raise the, what you have to reason about so you can easily port your applications or specific kinds of applications across clouds. Um, what we're not doing is thinking about standards. Uh, I, the world doesn't need standards, actually. Uh, it's likely that the kind of evolution of computing, the, the improvements in abstractions will, will generate those as, as a side effect. You think, take Lambda, for example, Amazon's uh, function service. Um, a lot of the cloud provide very similar functionality because that was the pattern that, that emerged uh, as a strong way to represent that kind of computation. Um, so we're, we're really interested in, in how to, to maybe accelerate that process, think about the right abstractions, uh, how to generalize something like S3 so you can store across different clouds in a more abstract way. Um, yeah, it's still early uh, and people are interested should reach out. We're, we're still trying to figure out this future. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming to the meetup today. And uh, we're a little over time, so many of us have to go in all hands for IT, but really appreciated this. And this will be posted on the web. We'll edit out a couple things for you. And thanks for coming. This right, is thank you all. positive. Thank you. Incredible stuff. Thank you. Folks in December. Bye-bye. <laughs>